It's the end of the day with Ray. Hello, my friends. Hey, I wanted to bring Matthew Kanaski back. And Matthew is the Vice President of Sales at Marco Technologies. And, you know, Matthew is very, very insightful. He's helping transition a company. Of course, that company's been transitioning for about a decade, so they do it well. But Matthew's on the executive team. And, folks, over the last couple of months, we've talked about how to manage sales reps from different generations. And I brought Matthew on today because I want to talk about how the managers from different generations kind of manage themselves and lead companies. Matthew, how are you doing, man? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Ray. Well, you know, Matthew, you're a millennial leader and extremely, probably one of the most successful copier dealers in the country here. And, you know, you guys are doing it right. You transitioned into IT, done some interesting things. But I wanted to ask you a question. On your leadership team, the people running this company, what's the split between the millennial generation and folks as old as me? Well, I'll tell you, in the last two years, uh, we've transitioned that ratio pretty heavily to nearly 50-50 now, in, in which, um, you know, about 50% of them are in my age range. Well, that's pretty good. So you guys don't have too many conflicts. <laughs> that was a... <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so, you know, we, uh, we certainly have our debate. <laughs> well, Matthew, let's talk about that because, you know, when you look at a company that's trying to innovate... Or in our industry, we have to reinvent ourselves big time. I mean, even though Marco's transition, you're constantly reinventing yourself. You know, I talked to my friends down at RJ Young yesterday. I mean, the progressive dealers in the marketplace are in this constant reinvention stage. How do you how do you deal with these older, you know, let's be honest, senior leaders that could be some stuck in some status quo or this is how we've always done it? Can you give us some insight on how you guys work through some of those challenges? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think it starts um having good fundamental leadership team on the uh let's go the older side okay mm -hmm. that there's a uh, there's a willingness and um a, a cognitive uh acceptance of the challenge right knowing that the the younger crew of leaders are going to come in with a different approach to business because we've just experienced the business world differently in our short time engaging in it you know say 15 to 20 years and, and our, our way has been all digital mm -hmm. and has been all efficiency and all speed, right? And so, you know, our uh, ability to change or our willingness to change or our willingness to create and innovate um, is extreme. However, we can't abandon the wisdom mm -hmm. that comes from the other side of the house um, with all of the tried and true methodologies, the, the proven methodologies that have generated very successful companies. It's really just a, an open collaboration from the team, understanding that we're all going to challenge each other. And if we challenge each other well enough, we actually start to meld these ideas together and create something new. But I think fundamentally at the bottom of it is remove the fear of creating something new. There is no playbook. There is no peer group. There is no example to follow. We actually have to write and create it. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty exciting. Well, you know, I got one of my Rayisms. You know, innovators don't follow directions; they write directions that others will follow. And I think, you know, Marco's been writing some directions for our industry for a long time. But you know, that's all good, and we have these older leaders, and they're going to hear all the time, "Oh, we're so innovative, we're so innovative," until you, you know, challenge them a little bit, and it always goes back to we either tried that before, or this always rock solid. We're making money on it. You know, I was talking, as a great example, I was talking with R.J. Young yesterday, and he's talking about they're a big production house. They sell a lot of production printers, but their new model of taking some of that in-house will eliminate them selling production printers. So they have to literally say, we're going to abandon some of this to do some of this, but this new thing could make us more money. Is there anything that Marco, you know, you could speak of specifically that maybe that came into play, where, where the old way was kind of like giving you some fight, but the new way really turned out to be better? Sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll level set it with, you know, kind of <clears throat> the old way has to have a certain acceptance of risk, right? Going and knowing that there's risk to this. But at the, on the flip side is the new way has to be willing to take responsibility and accountability, right? If you're going to push an idea, you need to be accountable for it and the results that come from it. And that's the expectation of, of your leadership team. Now, um, you know, some things, for example, maybe the, the compensation model. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we tried something new about two years ago as we had contention on what's the most important thing or what should we spend the most on or what's getting recognized the highest. Um, and, you know, obviously rep behavior follows those trends, right? Sure. Whatever gets the limelight is what reps want to sell the most of. And so we, we came up with this concept of essentially 
flattening the portfolio and trying to create equal weighting or equal distribution of the different things we sell. So that way you could get to your goal or you could be seen as a high performer by contributing the sum of all parts or participating in different parts of the portfolio. Because if you only look at hardware, right, or you only look at gross profit from hardware, that's going to favor certain sellers that focus in that area. But you might have an up and comer who's selling a bunch of managed services, not getting acknowledged the same way, but they're both contributing meaningful profit to the organization. In fact, equal, maybe even superior profit on the managed service side, but they're not getting acknowledged, you know, throughout the organization because of that structure. So we flattened and challenged the whole compensation model in which we basically put together a mechanism that allowed them to all sit on equal ground. So if you're one of those longtime hardware sellers, right, and that's somewhat of a legacy seller, or you're one of these new up and comer SaaS based recurring managed sellers, your GP contributions are on a level playing field, regardless of 10 years of tenure or one year of tenure. GP is GP. So we kind of flattened the playing field there. Well, that's pretty sweet. And did, obviously you saw some results from that. I mean, what's the, what was the team's conception? Yeah. I mean, the, the acceptance has been very strong and now we're about to go to a version two where we're going to try to blend IT and copier into this thing and flatten those ecosystems and somehow get them on level playing field. Right. Cause you know, we're all dealing with this challenge of, um, you know, a sales rep's going to go, well, which one's more important selling copiers or selling IT, right. Or uh, which one's worth more, or which one creates more profit. And we're going to kind of turn those valves again, just to flatten it out. So, Hey, sell all technology solutions to your customer, be their advisor, be their resource. And all the products and services will come with that relationship and you'll get equal distribution from them. Pretty interesting. So I would say, yeah, the, the acceptance has been pretty strong. Uh, so much so that we have people, you know, for the first time in, in my career going, hey, please don't change our comp plan again. It's working really well. Uh, you guys change stuff all, all the time. Can we just leave it alone? Yeah, well, that's good, I guess. As long as you're getting the results, and we all know if you pay for the results you want to get, you know. Let me ask you this, you know, Matthew. When you look at the older generation from a sales mythology, you know, they, they, can, they, they look at relationships a whole lot different than the millennials of, of your age group. And, can you share a little bit of some of your experience and maybe some of the disagreements or some of the challenges you have in that arena? Sure. Um, you know, what I would say is that I have made a comment that sometimes we sell relationship to a fault mm -hmm. um, or customers consume on relationship to a fault. Uh, they, they know the person so well, they've done business with them for so long, they, they trust them. That doesn't, none of that indicates they're going to get the right solution or actually solve a business challenge for their for their company. Mm -hmm. It just means they like the person, they like the company, they're reliable, they follow through, they're trustworthy. Those are all great qualities. But it still doesn't necessarily translate to an actual solution for a business. Mm -hmm. And what we've seen is the one who provides the solution generally gets the business, right? Or, or will displace the relationship because they're adding more value to the to the company mm -hmm. than just being someone they like. Now both have their value and both uh, generate revenue, right? But it, it's that transition from purely relationship to becoming more of a advisor and a solution provider to your customers. Um, that's the happy mix. The relationship gets you the meetings, gets you the engagements, gets you the opportunities. However, it doesn't necessarily close them. Mm -hmm. So we can get to the table as many times as we want, but to actually close the deal, you got to deliver value. You got to deliver an outcome. You got to deliver a solution to that business. Um, so that, that's the mix, right? Where the the uh, the other side is they don't have those relationships. It's a heck of a lot harder to get meetings. It's a lot harder to get those engagements with customers. It's harder to get to the leadership or executive team, the true decision makers, and get them to take you seriously. You might have the best solution, best pitch, you know, the, the best problem solved for that company, but you can't get to the table. So it's a, it's a mix of both. Well, you know, I would say, and I say this a lot, that you could be the vendor with the greatest relationships in the world and lose to the innovative organization that delivers a better experience. And, you know, people are buying that experience. We, we know, you know, you, you do anyway, that, you know, that, that experience is found more and more in that digital intersection, I call it, and being able to navigate through that. Do you have any pushback from the older generation when you start really talking about 
this digital landscape, either from a marketing perspective on social media or using LinkedIn as an example versus how they maybe prospected back in 1990? Are you guys, you know, still fighting with some of those challenges or have you worked through that? Yeah, we, we really are. Um, it, and this has become more transparent this year than ever as uh, one thing really shut down as a fundamental sales tactic and it evaporated. Door knocking, cold calling, turning knobs, right, and dropping off business cards, shaking hands, meeting people in person. Um, just that organic prospecting, it's kind of gone. It's evaporated. You can't do that. You can't just go open doors and walk in anymore. Mm -hmm. And um, so those that didn't transition into that, you know, uh, the digital landscape of, of contacting and communication, communicating and establishing relationships digitally, uh, we're at a major disadvantage in this transition. And that really moved that methodology to the forefront of the way we do it now versus the way we used to do it. And um, that's been a challenge for some sellers. Even the fundamental basics of, of using a computer or using applications or understanding how to navigate portals and tools and configurations, um, that, those are new things in a sales role that like computer literacy and navigating software wasn't really a major portion, right? We all had our challenges of getting sales reps to use the CRM. I think that's been a challenge for 20 years, right? But it's deeper than that now, right? Automated prospecting tools, LinkedIn Sales Navigator, sales enablement platforms, learning and development systems, those are all part of the job now, and those are highly like end-user PC-based skills. Mm -hmm. um, and those are somewhat lacking in, in legacy sellers, and it's putting them at a disadvantage, and they're getting outpaced by the, the people that that's native to. When you bring up this stuff, so you have a team, you know, you're managing your team and you have probably mixed generations on the team you manage. And, you know, obviously the older, the older folks are probably struggling, you know, with the Zoom meetings and doing demos and presentations through Zoom. And, you know, the younger generation was born with it, so they're very adapt to it. Are the older folks really engaging with the younger folks? Do you team them up together? I mean, how are you getting the, those older folks up to speed? Because they got to get to speed. <laughs> Yeah, uh, you know, I think uh, it actually alludes to the first thing we're talking about is uh, the leadership ranks being native to those skill sets are really helping coach and develop uh, those sellers into this methodology. So for the most part, I mean, the vast majority, all of our sales management, sales director ranks are very savvy with this stuff and very comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, even though they just, half of them got thrown right into it, mm -hmm. but they adopted, they pivoted, and they accepted it. So really, the, um, spending our time there to make sure that this now becomes part of your repeatable management strategy. This now becomes part of your learning and development, your coaching of your of your rep. It's not only pipeline, forecast, funnel development, although those are highly important, and we always do those. There's your legacy yeah. stuff. Tried and true. We're always keeping that. But now there's this other part of your one-on-one, -on -one, which is your own personal digital transformation. And how are you evolving through that? And once people start seeing the bridge to actual pipeline building and actual opportunity building from learning those skills, the adoption skyrockets. Because again, if you can't deliver an outcome to the person, they're not going to engage in the technology. So um, we really, the focus there, Ray, is at the management level to make sure that they're making that part of their learning and development coaching of their reps. Well, you know, it starts at Marco at the top. You know, you got Jeff Gao, Ed Doug doing that, you know, their podcast, they're living in this digital world. They're on social media. It still amazes me how many dealer principals are not on social media or are afraid to do video. So kudos to y'all on that. And hopefully we'll see more leadership getting into that space because they got to be able to navigate through that digital intersection. Matthew, it's always great having you on. I think you gave some insight to our friends. Is there anything you want to add before we end? The only thing I'll say here is one of the easiest things you can do to start your digital transformation with your sales force. Just tell them to use video every time they're on a conference. It sounds like such an easy thing, but it's amazing how many people don't turn that video on. And you, if you turn that video on, the experience and the accountability, it, it, it drives so much better behavior and engagement. Um, that is one of the simplest things you can do to start the transformation. Always turn on video on your internal meetings, your customer meetings. That's Wherever. a fantastic thing because I remember the old days. I'm an old guy, so we used to do our demos in the demo room. You know, we recorded them. Of course, we had those big, giant VHS recorders, but we recorded those demos so we could go back and look at how stupid we looked when we were doing things and really helped us tone that in. So that's great advice. You know, that's fantastic advice. Matthew, it's always great having you on. 
It's great seeing you all transition and doing the things you're doing there at Marco because we all know this. Status quo is the killer of all that will be invented. Don't get stuck in status quo, and I'll see you all tomorrow.